All summer long, algae have been wreaking havoc on Florida's waterways. From central Florida's Lake Okeechobee to estuaries along the coast, blooms of blue-green algae or cyanobacteria are killing aquatic life and threatening public health. Meanwhile, a separate red tide algae outbreak along Florida's southwest coast has been ongoing for nearly a year. The bloom has been tied to more than 100 manatee deaths and hundreds of reported fish kills. The algae blooms are taking a major toll on the state's fishing and tourism industries, and they've become a flashpoint in state politics as the November elections loom. We've had very intensive and even long red tide blooms. I've been here about 30 years, and it seems, again, about every seven to 10 years, we get a series of pretty bad blooms. I have to say, this one that we're experiencing right now is right at the top of the, the most intensive, and if it keeps going, it's gonna be one of the longest. Algae are photosynthetic microorganisms that occur naturally in the water. Blooms of algae, ranging from muddy brown to neon green in color, are caused by different dominant species. The red tide moniker refers to the pigmentation of Karenia brevis, a dinoflagellate which releases neurotoxins that can kill fish and other marine life and contaminate shellfish. During a severe red tide algae bloom, not only are the fish being killed, but big animals, dolphins, manatees, sea turtles, they're all suffering. Add to that the cyanobacterial blooms that are growing on Lake Okeechobee, specifically uh, an organism called microcystis. Microcystis is a type of blue-green algae that can be harmful to humans if ingested. By early July, blue-green algae had covered 90% of the surface of Lake Okeechobee, Florida's largest freshwater lake. The organism that we're dealing with now, this microcystis, has been linked to neurological disorders in humans, like early onset Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, and ALS. Under normal conditions, the growth of any one species of algae is kept in check by a variety of factors, including the temperature of the water, salinity levels, and nutrient concentrations. But when conditions are just right, a single species of algae can amass a takeover, throwing the entire ecosystem out of whack. So-called algae blooms form thick mats that choke out sunlight and gobble all the oxygen in the water column. This is a photosynthetic organism, so it's producing oxygen during the day, but at night, it's still respiring, so it can use up all the oxygen in a, in a shallow bay. During some algae blooms, like those initiated by Karenia brevis, dangerous levels of toxins can also accumulate in the water. And this particular organism is called a naked dinoflagellate, and it, it doesn't have armor, as some do, so it breaks apart pretty easy and releases the toxins into the water. And when waves break and you have bubbles going down in the water and coming back up, the bubbles scavenge the toxins because they like to absorb to the surface. And they get thrown up into the air, and that's what you're inhaling and that's what's hitting your nose. Blue-green algae live in freshwater and brackish environments. In Florida, blue-green algae blooms often start on Lake Okeechobee in the summer, when temperatures are high and sunlight is abundant, and when one other crucial ingredient is present, nutrients. Lake Okeechobee receives a lot of land runoff from agriculture and from livestock, as well as from uh, septic tank areas. And, and there's so many sources of nutrients, excess nutrients, that um, it, it, it's a real problem. Once a bloom gets going on the lake, it can seep into estuaries along Florida's coasts via the St. Lucie River to the east and the Caloosahatchee River to the west. That's exactly what's been happening all summer long and into the fall. Right now, the only major outlets for water to get out of the lake when it rains are two man-made drainage canals. One of those canals connects to the Caloosahatchee River, which pours into the Gulf of Mexico, and the other canal connects to the St. Lucie River, which runs into the Indian River Lagoon estuary two miles behind where I'm sitting right now. Those two canals have become dumping valves for Lake Okeechobee's water. Releases of lake water through these canals are managed by the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers, which started restricting the flow of water south of the lake and into Florida's Everglades in the mid 20th century. So Florida was swampland. So in order for people to live on it and have farms and, and produce food and, and have cattle and all that, they needed to drain the, the land. And so they did that by putting in a big dike. The dike broke, killed thousands of people. Army Corps of Engineers, their job was to prevent from flooding from that scenario. And what they did was create a system, engineered system, that works well. It prevents flooding from the development around Lake Okeechobee. Water is back pumped into Lake Okeechobee. When it gets to a certain stage, it is then released to both the St. Lucie River, Clusahatchee River. In these events, that water does not have the detention time to biologically, chemically, or physically degrade any kind of um, nutrients that might be in that overflow water. 
the red tide blooms in southwestern Florida don't start in a lake. Karenia brevis is a saltwater organism, and blooms of red tide initiate some 10 to 40 miles offshore. Currents and wind carry red tide to the coast, where its toxins can trigger fish kills, further fueling the bloom. Once a coastal red tide bloom is in progress, man-made nutrients can also help sustain it. Spanish explorers have documented red tide as far back as the 1500s. But in recent years, a series of severe blooms, including the one that started in 2017, have caused experts in the public to ask whether human activity is worsening these events. Karenia can use a, a number of different nutrient sources that includes things like dying zooplankton and possibly even the fish that its own toxins are killing it can use as nutrients. And of course, it can use nutrients coming from land. There has been some questions raised recently as to whether or not a large amount of cyanobacteria coming from, for example, Lake Okeechobee through Caloosahatchee could hit the marine water and those cells could lice and release nutrients. Certainly that's possible. The blue-green algae blooms that filled Lake Okeechobee this summer had spread to Florida's coastal estuaries by early July, sickening residents from Stewart to Fort Myers. The lake bloom isn't over yet, and the state has received recent reports of algae in canals in Fort Lauderdale and in Cape Coral. The red tide, meanwhile, still stretches over 100 miles of coastline, from Pinellas to Lee County. I wish I could say that we're close to seeing the end of this year's algae blooms in Florida, but that's not the case. We're seeing the red tide still intensely blooming in the Gulf of Mexico, and algal cover in Lake Okeechobee is actually on the upswing. We're seeing an increased amount of algae in the lake, and since freshwater discharges were just ramped up into the Caloosahatchee and St. Lucie rivers, that toxic cyanobacteria is leaving the lake and ending up in our coastal estuaries. One of our really popular swimming beaches was shut down because microcystis algae washed through our inlet and, and out to sea and ended up on our beaches. And climate change could make some algae blooms worse in the future. Algae tends to grow faster in warm, sunny conditions, and it also thrives in high nutrient environments. Climate change may generate more heat, but it also may generate more rainfall in certain areas, so we're going to have additional runoff pushing these nutrients into waterways where algae may grow. I think, I think in future years, the intensity and duration of algae blooms is going to expand, and some of that may be related to Earth-changing climate. Folks have proposed all kinds of technological solutions to the algae crisis, including a recent controversial idea to pump Lake Okeechobee's overflow water underground as a quick fix. But longer term, there's a much more basic step we need to take, and that's cleaning up our pollution. We need to stop this excessive amount of nutrient, the excessive amount of nuisance algae coming to the coast and impacting our coastal environment. Tougher regulations on the state's agricultural sector that reduce the amount of nutrients flowing into Lake Okeechobee and surrounding waterways would help. And there are actions individuals can take. Okay, so some of the things that you can do at home right now is during the rainy season, don't fertilize, you don't need it. We can go steps further and, and start retrofitting homes to not, not have that surface water runoff directly go from our roof down to our gutter, down to our driveway, right into a storm sewer without any treatment. So disconnecting that from that pipe network that brings that water right to our natural water bodies without treatment is, is the first step. But many experts think the biggest thing that needs to happen long term is restoring a more natural flow of water from Lake Okeechobee to the south where it could be filtered through remediation wetlands before reaching the Everglades. I think that the solution is taking a small piece of that Everglades agricultural land and turning it into a filtration marsh, a stormwater treatment area. Florida has stormwater treatment areas designed specifically to clean agricultural runoff and they work beautifully. We need a larger stormwater treatment area that can store and clean Lake Okeechobee's water, allowing that water to get into the Everglades where it's needed and keeping it out of the Caloosahatchee and St. Lucie estuaries. This effort, known as Everglades Restoration, has been discussed for decades, but it's faced stiff opposition from Florida's politically powerful sugar lobby. In July, the first Everglades Agricultural Area Reservoir to move and store more water south of the lake was finally approved by the White House. In September, House and Senate lawmakers reached an agreement on a water infrastructure bill that would authorize funds for the project, but the bill still needs to pass Congress. Experts estimate the reservoir will reduce discharges east and west of Lake Okeechobee by more than 60%. That could put a huge dent in the algae problem. Everything's tied together in our state and we need political support to make these projects happen. The good news is we're finally seeing our elected officials make the environment a priority for the first time in my memory. It's a problem that can be solved, but it's gonna take a lot of effort and a lot of funding to solve it. 